Welcome in to the KSO Sunday Show. I am Mason Both, joined by KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway. As always, Drew, let me tell you, you missed a crazy good time in Orlando, Florida for the Pop-Tarts Bowl. Uh, I mean, the Cats come away as champs. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I mean, it quite the, the media gift there. I was hunting throughout that stadium, keeping my eyes peeled. Uh, throughout Thursday, and I was like, where can I find one of the Pop-Tarts boxes with, like, the logos and stuff on them? I was close to going and just, like, sneaking into the seat or the suite that was reserved <laughs> there for the Pop-Tarts company. Uh, did not have to resort to that because we walked into the post-game press conference, and they had a bunch of boxes spread out in there. I think everybody got one that was in there. Uh, if not, I feel really bad for you. Uh, that would be a stinky feeling, uh, but... I at least got mine. I know Fan and uh, DY got theirs. Yep. So uh, it's that's a that's a cool souvenir to have from a bowl game, especially one as uh, that has become as iconic as that. Uh, and not only did I get pop tarts down there, I also got COVID uh, at some point. I I I don't think it actually happened on the trip. I'm sure it happened at one of the many uh, family Christmases that I had to attend in the lead up. And uh, just so nobody thinks I was trying to kill Fan. Uh, I did not feel sick Monday or Tuesday, and I really didn't start feeling bad until Wednesday night when uh, I, of all people, suggested we leave the Magic game early, which probably should have been an indication to everybody that I was not feeling well. Uh, I told some buddies that I was talking to, I was like, yeah, that should have been the first red flag. Uh, like me, of all people, saying, let's leave this sporting event early, which I do think based on traffic in Orlando, I would have suggested that even if I was 100%. But I was starting to be like, I might just be better off getting in the bed. Also, God bless the Arizona Cardinals to the five-yard line with a minute 15 left, trying to just save the Cowboys behind in this playoff race. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I am COVID up, and uh, it seems like I may have allegedly given it to D.Y. as well, uh, which is odd because I really wasn't around D.Y. that much. Uh, and the the closest that we ever were was probably when we recorded the 30 minute show on mm -hmm. well, that would have been Wednesday and I felt fine then. And also we were outside. So uh, I don't know, but I feel bad about uh, exposing everybody down there. And uh, I can guarantee you that the, my, my biggest punishment for that at the moment is that I came home and immediately was not able to uh, hang out with my daughters who hadn't seen me for five days. So she probably won't remember me when I see her tomorrow, but that'll be all right. Uh, <laughs> Drew, you were not at the game. How did it look on TV, and what were the emotions of that game for you? Uh, it was different watching it on TV. I mean, I, I know all of us now are at the point where, like, it's more rare if you're not there. So, like, it, it was just different in the sense of, like, I don't get to – you don't get to see everything kind of happen as it's happening. Uh, the the broadcast. I don't know if you guys have rewatched it already, but the broadcast loved them. Some Cooper Beebe and some Avery Johnson. It, it was strange being on ESPN and like NC State or, or like the other team, like K State's playing is like rarely mentioned. Like it, they couldn't go five seconds here at the end of the game without hyping up Cooper Beebe or Avery. Oh. Well, that is not what the family Facebook page told me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They said that this was very one sided towards NC State. Oh, see, I thought it was the complete opposite. The only, the only weird part about the broadcast, I thought, was uh, they were hyping up Cooper Beebe, and like, they were like, he doesn't need to be playing in this game, but he is anyway. And Andre Ware's like, yeah, that's great for college football. Yeah. <laughs> and the start of the second half, like literally for like probably the entire NC State first possession, they're interviewing Peyton Wilson. And I'm like, Th this isn't how it works. <laughs> Like yeah, if, that's, uh, if, if it's a little so contradictory. good football that Cooper BB is playing, you can't be like, so Peyton Wilson, you're not playing in this game, but if NC State won and got 10 game and won 10 games for the second time in school history, what would that mean to you? Because that was literally the first question they asked. <laughs> well, so like, that's, uh, that's tough for Peyton Wilson. So that part was strange, but it, it was fun watching it on TV, but being there is just so much more it's so much different because you can see plays really develop more. All right. Well, fan, you were there. Uh, what was it like to be at an Orlando uh, bowl game uh, in person, kind of getting to experience? Honestly, that was 
close to as perfect weather for a football game that you could have asked for no matter where it was located. But it was like low to mid 60s. It was clear, all that stuff. It was an awesome night for football. Uh, what did you take away from that game? Well, I, for the most part, I, as my as one, I haven't done the media thing for a long time, so I appreciated the Pop Tarts Bowl. Besides the game day meal, which was a boxed barbecue lunch, which was kind of strange. Other than that, everything was really good. Um, getting to go to the stadium the day before and do the tasting of all the uh, ballpark foods with Cheez Its and or Pop Tarts in them was was a pretty cool experience. And I'd never been to an NBA game before, and the the Pop Tarts Bowl sent us to a suite at the Magic game, which was fun, as, as Mason said. Um, did not make me more of an NBA fan, probably made me less <laughs> an NBA fan to be there in person, but that was fun. But just the game day experience was was a cool, um, it was kind of an up and down game as a K-State fan, pretty high early, kind of a little bit of a drop, and then you feel pretty decent going into the halftime, and then the third quarter was not fun to watch even though NC State really didn't take that great of advantage of it until they faked a punt. And then and then to see K-State close it out, you know, with that super long drive and then get the interception and run the clock out was 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 a good way to f- finish the season. Um, it's always fun to win a bowl game because then, then you talk about how important bowl games are and how great they are. Whereas when you lose, it's a bowl game is a meaningless ex- exhibition. So this was not a meaningless exhibition. It was a good – preview for the 2024 season the way we're kind of look at it today all right well let's let's just start there with how we talk about bowl games then because there is right now especially this weird gray area between like it ends your 2023 season but it kicks off your 2024 and all that I mean it does feel like for K-State probably mainly because of the Avery Johnson thing this was a springboard for 2024 even though you had a guy like Cooper Beebe completing one of the best K-State careers of all time in this game and finishing 2023 with so many other really talented seniors on that offensive line and in other areas. Uh, but, I mean, what what did this game mean in terms of how you will think back on 2023? Did this salvage the way that the season felt? Because I'll be honest with you, like my whole perception of the 2023 season really took a hard hit with that loss to Iowa State and how K-State played in that game and what that result ultimately did to them. And let me tell you, did not get any better on Friday listening to the Liberty Bowl and Iowa State just not show up in that game. Uh, That was very painful. So I'll ask you guys, how did the uh, Pop-Tarts Bowl either change or save your perception of the 2023 season? Yeah, I I would say... It didn't affect my view of the season a lot. I think the the season itself will still be disappointing because of the close losses that you had missed opportunities. Iowa State loss was just a whole nother ball game of what went wrong and and even more mystifying looking, seeing Iowa State not be able to run the ball against a defense rated outside the top 100 in the country in Memphis. Um, Abu Saba had basically no yards in that game and he destroyed us. So that that still affects my view of the season. Uh, this is a nice capper, though, to get to nine wins, which is always it's always good to have a nine-win season. Plus, I think it is more of a, uh, outside the offensive line, it is more of a preview to what 2024 can be uh, across the board, really, both sides of the ball. Um, there were some, you know, we had some defensive players that won't be back, but most of them were not guys that were stars of the game on defense. And offensively, we were led by guys that are all going to be back. Avery Johnson, DJ Giddens, Jace Brown, Keegan Johnson, Garrett Oakley were all our main guys on offense. So uh, skill position-wise, I think there's still guys that need to be added. But you look back at this game saying uh, 2024 could be pretty good considering the new Big 12 and the schedule k is going to have. Yeah, for me, it doesn't change a, a lot about this season. And, and like fans said, it's not just the Iowa State game, but it's the close losses because winning 10 games just feels like more meaningful. And knowing how close K State was to not just having 10 wins, but potentially 11, or if everything run, runs uh, perfectly together, 
what there was nothing really stopping them from winning every single game that they played this season. So I think for me, that's why it's still a little bit disappointing. I mean, but I also think it's a good thing right now that we can sit here and say nine and four disappointing. Like you're you're in a good spot when nine wins is a disappointment because I know one team was really celebrating when they got their ninth win over a Mountain West school <laughs> earlier this week. So it it doesn't do a whole lot in terms of was this season more of a success to me, but it it, it is also like a fun springboard it, and perspective like four bowl games going forward. I think it kind of depends on who you are and what you have going into the bowl game. Like Oklahoma state was more of like a celebration of this was our team this year. It's like you still had Alan Bowman at quarterback and you didn't know who all was going to come back for Oklahoma state. Where like for Cape state, it was more of a springboard for 2024. And it was fun to see a bunch of the younger players play and to see Avery play and get the start and, I know that we'll get into this later on, uh, but it was just fun to see how everything will potentially look going forward. Uh, you, you mentioned the young guys. Are you are you surprised or disappointed that we didn't see more of the young guys playing the game? Like I think some would have anticipated Joe Jackson played at least a little bit in the game. Uh, I wish we would have seen a guy like Trey Spivey playing the game some, just because you know early in the year in the SEMO game, it seemed like there was already a couple of good connections and and you know chemistry between him and Avery Johnson and this is this is to take nothing away from a guy like Seth Porter who was in the game and you know probably playing the close to the most snaps he's ever gotten at wide receiver uh he deserved it he put a lot of time in but I would have preferred to see more Trey Spivey snaps in that situation um just because number one I think there's more of a playmaking ability there that K-State could have used at times and also just the fact that like and uh, get these guys ready for next year. I, I I'll say probably yes, but at the same time, I, I feel like when you have somebody like Seth Porter that comes and just works his ass off for six seasons that you kind of, you need to reward that to keep your culture still going. So I, I would have liked to see more Seth Porter snaps, but at the same or uh, more trace Spivey snap. But at the same time, like, I, I don't know where you mix them in because you probably need to keep that culture of, hey, if you're going to work hard while you're here, like, we'll reward you. And, and like, there's just a fine line. And along the same line as uh, if you get more Trace Spivey snaps, you're probably getting less Keegan Johnson and less Jace Brown snaps because you're probably not going to play Trace Spivey in the slot. Yeah, I, I think that's that is the balance of especially in the portal era. What do you do with these guys? And and that's where I do think while it is a prelude to the next season, I, I do think it's a good I don't think it's a bad thing to honor some of your guys that have been five or six year guys in your program. And uh and I don't know how much you know, I think probably you'll see some changes in scheme over the course of the summer going to the next fall camp based on the changes in personnel and offensive line, you know, hopefully you bring in a receiver or two from the portal still. Um, you've got your new guys coming in. So I, I'm sure they gave those guys every opportunity to make a move and, and be a person that was going to play more in this game. But at the end of the day, if they don't earn it, they don't earn it. And I don't think it's, true. it's a good idea for your program to just throw guys out there to say, hey, you're going to play next year even though you haven't done anything in practice the last three weeks and Seth Porter's been a better player, we're going to play you anyway. I think that can send bad messages, but I, you know, I don't know as a, as a coach in this era, it's got to be tough for those guys because they've got to be thinking through all those scenarios and, and will this bowl game really affect uh, some of these guys enough that they'll want to look at the portal. Um, and I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. It's just, you kind of go by feel and, Hopefully you have good relationships with your players that don't play a lot and bring them back. And if they have potential over the summer, you're going to say, Hey, this is what you got to do. If you want to be one of the top three guys on the receiver core, uh, you've got to do this, this, and this and such. Uh, and those conversations probably, I don't think 
are going to happen in the bowl practice season as much as they will after the bowl game's over. So you just got to hope it doesn't run a guy off. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's the bowl practice thing. You, you mean you think about this? We've still got a couple days left where the portal is going to be open. Like, the, you think you're out of clear, but you're still like second guessing every little decision yeah. personnel wise as a coach to try and make sure you're not going to lose anybody else because now you're down to the guys that you don't want to lose if you have them still. Uh, and if you lose them, then that's a major deal. Uh, which I guess you know we'll get ready to transition into talking a little bit more about Avery Johnson. But before we do, uh, it, you just s- scale of one to one hundred, so a, a percentage here. Uh, how confident are both of you that Avery Johnson is not going to be going into that transfer portal uh, before the the January second deadline? Ninety-eight. I'm yeah. gonna say I'm gonna be confident. Say a hundred after the way he spoke and everything went down in Orlando. Yeah, I, I, I would kind of go with Drew. I'd say 98 because there's always that chance some crazy program with tons of money sees what he did in the game because this is the first time you actually saw him play a whole game. Yeah. And some program with crazy money and a spot open comes in and says, hey, um, what what are you going to do? And I think I think at the end of the day, he's, he's going to stay with K-State and, and likes his situation here. Which, to that effect, uh, essentially, I mean – where did Avery Johnson meet kind of the expectations and the maybe the hype that everybody or yourself had for him in this game? And I guess overall, but it all was channeled into this one game because, I mean, I, look, I, I think we all know that he's a pretty special player. He already had some special moments this season, but he made plays and he did it in a nice, effective way. We got to see him as a full time of prep as a starting quarterback. He was going to be primarily a passer in this game. He threw 31 passes and he didn't have to use his legs constantly to be a serious threat, but he was still going to use them when needed. He had the big uh, third down run for a first down to keep a drive alive. He won the game and secured it with a fourth and five run. And then also the the major touchdown run that was a design pass play where he scrambled. And I mean, that was pretty electric. So where did Avery Johnson come in with expectations? Was he under them, at them, or above them? I would would say for me, he was above what I expected for the game. Um, Number one, he didn't make any major mistakes, no interceptions. Um, He was very protective of the ball while still trying to make a play like when he would scramble in the pocket um he seemed to make decisions of when he was going to scramble and go make a play um more like if it was a third down situation versus first or second down he was going to scramble by time get to the sideline he'd kind of hang out by the sideline a couple times and then if no one came open he just threw the ball away out of bounds that's pretty impressive um before the end of the before that last drive, which is really a garbage run out the clock drive, he ran the ball maybe one or twice, twice, maybe two called runs. I think one was a draw, one was d- debatable if it was a read or if it was a mistake in the backfield. Um, and then he had the three scrambles for 49 yards um, before that as well. So not asked to run the ball a lot. Pretty impressive um, eluf- elusiveness of the pocket. Made some really good throws. Didn't get helped out a couple times. Probably had to, should have had three or four more catches on the day. Uh, Cause he ended up what fourteen to thirty-one. Probably should have been more like seventeen or eighteen to thirty-one at the end of the day. One hundred seventy-eight yards, not a huge yardage night, but um, he did enough. You know, because it was only a ten-possession game at the end of the day as well. It wasn't a huge possession game. K State only ran sixty-four non-garbage plays. So, um, given the the pace of the game, the plays, NC State played really slow. Um, so K State took advantage of that and had a really good ball game. You know, you lead K State to 2.8 points per drive against <clears throat> one of the top defenses in the country. How about without Peyton Wilson? You got to take that into account. But still, that's a really good defense. Um, in the first half, it was 4.2 points per drive, which is was incredible at the time. And uh, not a not a bad game at all. And I think definitely could have you know very well he could have struggled much more in that game, could have thrown an ugly interception or, or had a, a, a major mistake, and we didn't see that. So I think it's above expectations for me compared to what I thought he would do coming in the game. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're anybody that says that he either 
met your expectation or was below, you either had way too high of expectations <laughs> or way too low. It's like, it was, and the thing that I took away right away, and I've uh, messaged a few other people this throughout the, the rest of the bowl games, because, you know, what, what else are you going to watch on TV right now? You got all these bowls on, there's nothing else to do. Uh, and I keep telling everybody, I, like, the, my main takeaway is, when other freshman quarterbacks have came into the game or have had to come into the game, they have not looked comfortable at all. And I think that's where Avery Johnson is special. He looked like he belonged and was never rattled, never panicked. You saw it in the two-minute drill before the end of the half of how remarkably composed he is. And, I mean, I it, it's crazy because, like, this is just the, how freshman quarterbacks are. I mean, we saw Avery Johnson look like that. Literally the next game, Jackson Arnold turns the ball over five times. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it easily could have gone that way and it didn't. And I think that just shows how special that Avery Johnson is and will likely keep ascending because he did miss on a few throws or a few drops. I, I think the one that he probably wants back the most was the one where he was scrambling out. And I think it was a third down play where he just missed Keegan Johnson. Yep. But, yep. but he threw some strikes. Uh, the fourth quarter, uh, the drive that essentially put the game away, uh, the third down throw to Keegan Johnson, which was a really good route by Keegan Johnson to get open and go get up and go get the ball. So, I mean, we, we saw the flashes. And if you... Look at the actual stats. You're probably thinking, oh, 14 of 31. Like, he must not be able to throw very well. I'd say probably six of those were throwaways mm -hmm. with four more drops. So he he can throw the ball and throw the ball in some tight spots. That that throw to Jace Brown, to I'll just say to win the game, was special. Yeah, that was really good. Well, and I mean, you, you look at it, even he threw it 17 incompletions. His QBR on ESPN was still 94.8, which is a pretty, yeah. pretty strong number given, you know, most of the time guys do that. They've had some phenomenal limited incompletion, big yardage type day passing. Um, there, there, there's some substance to it. I'd even look to go see what maybe uh, the PFF grade was that they gave out for him. For, he was the like, highest rated uh, player on on the offense. Okay, I, I was going to assume that it was probably something like that because uh, he, I mean, he played he played pretty well. So, yeah, I mean, I I thought it was special, and I, I think even more so after the game ends and you're hearing everybody talk about how he played within the game, whether it's Chris Kleiman or TJ Giddens or anybody else. But basically, probably the most impressive parts about it is that it just seemed like he had total control and command of the offense as a true freshman making his first start at quarterback. Yeah, that, that's special stuff to be 19 years old and two of your passing touchdowns were plays that you checked into. Yeah. Like yeah, that. that that's not normal. Yeah, that I mean, that to me was the, the thing that I was most impressed with. And I mean, the throw he made to DJ Gins, yes, Gins was wide open, essentially, but the pressure was coming. He was kind of falling back and he put the throw in the perfect spot. Um, that like that was that was pretty good in a nice way to just start things off momentum wise for case because mm -hmm. so many times if a play like that doesn't go your way i mean the the totality of that game could be changed uh, and so he stepped up he made it so yeah he he exceeded my expectations going into that game um and maybe it was going to be easy for him to do that but i don't think it was because to kind of drew's point i do think that i had lofty expectations for what was going to come on and like the fact that i mean it's not like he he didn't have enough opportunities this year to make a mistake when in a game and the fact that uh, i mean the final numbers he threw 66 passes as a freshman and didn't throw an interception and i'm not really sure he had many that were even like interceptable balls that he threw uh, that's just a, an impressive thing and then you talk about watching other bowl games drew like Think of Ohio State, like one of the best programs in the country. Yeah. They had a, so a sophomore look bad, and they had a freshman look bad against Missouri. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy stuff. I mean, you, you talk about the, the DJ Giddens play. 
And it reminded me of uh, how you talked about how a game could go a different way. Looking back on how this NC State game played out, that play ends up being pretty similar to uh, the fourth and eight play against Oklahoma State at home in 2022 when it was the Cade Warner deep ball and catch <laughs> on fourth down. Yeah. Where if that if that pass is incomplete, does that game go a different way? If this pass is incomplete, does this go a different way? Well, and the other thing too, like to to think about then, uh, talking about freshman quarterbacks and everything, like every game that Avery Johnson played in this year, where he had you know more like the Texas game, the Missouri game, it's not like he had an overwhelming amount of snaps, but any game he had more extended time in. Like he he was better in all of those games than Will Howard ever was as a freshman. Um, you think about like Skylar Thompson as a as a redshirt freshman. Skylar had some moments, but like I don't know that it like the totality of the the, the game he played in ever looked as in as crisp or solid uh, as what Avery Johnson did. So pretty impressive there uh, for what he was going to do. Uh, real quick, uh, let's play a little video for everybody and a sound bite for uh, my favorite thing from the Pop Tarts Bowl. <laughs> and they came back to play for Connor Riley. Thanks. All right, so that was a great moment uh, for Chris Klein after the game. I don't think I'd ever seen uh, anybody running a press conference just openly like, here's your beer, coach. Go enjoy it. So uh, <laughs> That was a lot of fun and a uh, really good moment that obviously Chris Kleiman looking out for his guy, Gene Taylor, like make sure he gets one too. Uh, what I mean, that was a, a great moment. How deserving of that beer was Chris Kleiman for this season, that game, and everything else? I mean, I, I would say pretty deserving, but I, I would venture to say every single coach in college football right now probably deserves a beer. <laughs> the Like, the recruiting calendar is just so broken right now that it every coach probably deserves a, a, at least a beer at the end of the season. Yeah, I, I, I would say... Because it was a nine-win season, K State's more than likely going to be ranked in the top twenty-five to end the year. Um, you're going to be ranked in the top fifteen of the F plus metric ranking at the end of the year. So, all that combined, I think that's even with the disappointing close losses and, and the Iowa State thing. Um, I, I don't think in in at a, as a K State fan or at, at this school. A nine and four record should ever be looked down upon. I know there were expectations for higher than that. And I, I agree that we didn't meet the expectations this program set before it, for itself. Like the players, and even Kleiman talked about Big 12 championship is a goal for this season. Uh, so they didn't reach that goal, but they still had a heck of a season. And uh, anytime you can follow up a 10 win season with a nine win season, you know, the only other time since Bill Snyder 1.0 that we did that was 11 and 12. And so to, to reach the, that achievement and have, you know, 19 wins over two seasons, a lot of programs don't do that in their history. Uh, and K-State has done it, you know, twice now, uh, post 1.0 Bill Snyder, which was a di completely different era. Uh, and to see us do that now in the portal era um, and after Bill Snyder 1.0 and 2.0 in Kleiman clearly showing he has a solid program and K-State's going to be a, a program we reckon with in the new Big 12, I think, is significant. He deserves a beer, and I'd, I'd say, you know, if he liked bourbon, I'd tell him to have a bourbon. <laughs> I, I will say this. Uh, I, it really is going to stick with me, just probably the Iowa State game more than any <laughs> of them, but, like, this should have been another 10-win season for K-State. It absolutely <laughs> should have, uh, especially when you look around and you see, like, the only single-digit win that they had was the game at KU. Um, so, like, you can't even really do a lot of the, well, they could have lo lost this game, though. No, they, they really couldn't have lost many of these games this year. Um, they were that dominant, and the teams that they did <laughs> lose to outside of Iowa State were all really freaking good teams. Um, I mean, Oklahoma State is, like, the one that you can debate there, 
and they played for the Big 12 title, and they beat an SEC team in their bowl game, and they had some awesome playmakers on their team this year. It's just – that's a little maddening for this season. But as I summed it up, uh, I tweeted it last night. Listening to that Iowa State game on Friday and thinking about how K-State played against NC State and so many of these other things, it makes it really frustrating to think about that Iowa State game and how many defensive guys left the team immediately after that game ended. And you start to think about effort and energy. Like, I don't question a single thing the offense did in that game for K-State. They did about as well as they could have, given everything. Uh, and certainly, like, you can't, you cannot question Will Howard or Ben Sennett's motivation in that game. Philip Brooks, like guys that, yes, they did not play in the bowl game for K State. Two of them are moving on to a professional career. Maybe Will does too, but like, I'm not questioning those guys. Like, I know where their intent and heart was. I like, I really hate to do it, but like, I, I genuinely have questions about where some guys' heads were at on that defense in that game because there's really no other explanation for how poor it was for K-State, especially after the way things went for Iowa Iowa State against Memphis. So uh, that's really going to just – that's going to stick with me for a, a, a long time, and I'm going to have some what-ifs there, and we'll never get the answer to it. But it would be kind of fascinating to, uh, at some point, like way down the road um, – get the insight from like players on this team or coaches about like if they wish they had done anything different in that game, like would it have made sense to yank some guys earlier in that game against, uh, against Iowa state and just say, you know what? Like you don't have it for us. We're getting you out of there. You're not helping us right now. Um, something along those lines, because it was just so, so bad in that game, the way it ended up working out. And I mean, you go through and you can kind of look at how things ended up going down. Like it just not a, not a good night in general uh, effort wise for K-State in that game. Uh, and and two of the guys that hit the transfer portal, they did not get very good uh, like tackling grades in that game from PFF. So it, it is what it is. It's, it's a moot point here and uh, we can move on. A uh, last thing that's loosely attached to the pop darts bull kind of goes into next year though, is Connor Riley is the offensive coordinator. Uh, Fan has we we talked about it a little bit. Obviously, we had a lot of time on the road together, and and right after the game, <laughs> Dwyane and I talked about it. But I'll open it up to a bigger discussion here. Um, number one, did you get at least enough to be okay with Connor Riley being the offensive coordinator next season? And what were your opinions of how he handled the game? I'll, I'll give mine first, since so many times I make you guys go, and then I'll just chime in whenever I want. Um, I I won't be like. 100% like Yahoo, like this man can do the job type deal. I'm not going to do that. Uh, that's silly for anybody that has never done a job that they're being asked to do. But what I will say, he had spurts and was impressive enough at times in the Pop-Tarts Bowl to make me think that he is capable of handling this job. Um, obviously, he had a phenomenal first quarter and really first half. And the fact that K-State was able to put together a drive in two minutes to go down and get a score that really should have kept it at 21-7 to at halftime, not 21-10, to was impressive. And then, honestly, like the most impressive drive of the night was probably the last touchdown drive where you just had a major punt return taken back. You got a huge touchdown taken back. And... In the end, both of those penalties ended up helping K-State because it kept NC State's offense off the field even longer, and K-State goes 15 plays to get a touchdown. That was probably the most impressive drive that Connor Riley could have done, and sure, he had an awesome quarterback, but at the end of the day, that is still a true freshman at quarterback for him. It's not like it was you know, some fifth-year senior that he, he could run an offense without an offensive coordinator. Avery Johnson still needed to be guided somewhat in this game, and Connor Riley did a pretty good job of it for his first time out doing it. So I'm not going to be disappointed if Chris Kleiman chooses Connor Riley for multiple reasons. He did fine in the Pop Tarts Bowl, probably exceeded my expectations in all honesty. And if you kind of look around and think about everything else, like Chris Kleiman obviously loves Connor Riley, thinks the world of him as a coach. His players think very highly of him. 
And I think you can tell that Avery Johnson was pleasantly surprised and pleased with how uh, everything worked out there with Connor Riley. So I'm good with Connor Riley as OC next season. Yeah, it goes back to one of our first questions, right? If if Avery Johnson exceeded expectations, and I think you've got to give some credit to the office coordinator for putting him in position to be successful as well. And so I, that would be number one. Number two, just breaking down the game, you know, I thought there was a good mix of personnel, um, almost 50-50 with, with two tight ends and one tight end, um, all one back some spread stuff, you know, they spread it out with Oakley generally spread out with four wide uh, sets, 23 times out of 63 plays. So pretty good mix of formation, even though, you know, like Colin Klein, he liked to keep, you know, the same personnel on the field, just mix up personnel formation wise. Um, good mix of run and pass, almost 50, 50 there. Um, the running game in the first half was extraordinary. Um, really good. And I think if anything, the, my biggest fault was, I think the running game was so good in the first half, he probably went back to it more than he should have in the second half when NC State definitely loaded the box and took that away. Because you go from 150 yards rushing in the first half, over eight yards of carry, almost nine yards of carry, and a 71% success rate, which is pretty phenomenal. You know, Even if you take the fake punt out, that's pretty good numbers. And then the second half, 73 yards, 4.3 yards of carry, and a 29% success rate. So. Definitely was a drop, and that does not include the last drive where we had a higher success rate running off the clock. So that would be the biggest fault is uh, is uh, g- getting that running game a little bit too focused, a lot of first down runs in the second half the case they got blown up on. You know, even though the first three drives, um, the thing is three of those four drives were not three and outs. One was a three and out, but they got a first down play in each one of the, three of the other drives. And usually when you – get that first down play and they were 15 yards, 12 yards and 22 yards, uh, those bigger plays. Usually when you get one of those, then you usually get in a rhythm and can get going in case they just couldn't do that after even picking up a first down on each one of those drives. So that was disappointing, but I do think it comes back to um, <clears throat> he was stuck on running the ball a little bit just because it was so successful. And then it, it didn't, it didn't work out, but then, you know, to end the game, both to get the game winning drive and to run out the clock in case they went to the run and had success with it, even with NC State loading the box. So it worked out in the end. I would not be disappointed to see him be the office coordinator. I think that's probably likely what's going to happen based on Clement's comments after the game. Uh, We'll see what happens, but I think it would be a good move. I do think it'd be nice to bring in one new offensive coach with passing game experience to add to the staff, but we'll see what happens with that. Real quick, I'll say something else real, before Drew gets in here. Uh, it's good to point out that they still picked up first downs on a handful of those drives where there was a lull in scoring. And, you know, maybe you guys have a better, uh, like, memory of this than me. Sometimes it's, it's tougher, like, being directly on the field, watching it and remembering things sequence by sequence. But we already talked about, like, how many drops there were in in the game. Like, so how many of those came into play there? And how many little things that we could look at and say, you know, if that toss-up goes K-State's way, then they're not having to stall out and kick it from here or whatever. I will say, I did think they, what, it was the the third quarter, maybe the, the first or second drive that stalled out around, you know, maybe like the 40, 45-yard line. I thought K-State probably could have and should have gone for it there. I would have liked to have seen – a little bit more aggressiveness. I don't think you lose a whole lot. Um, it ultimately ended up working out, though, because NC State decided to also not go for it, and they missed a field goal uh, to follow up that drive. So um, that was just something I thought. So, Drew, uh, take it away with your Connor Riley thoughts. So all in all, like I, I was pretty impressed. I, I've i always thought really high of Connor Riley as a coach and as a person and just know how much that the players really enjoy uh, his presence and – you know, just talking to recruits, like recruits always really like him. And uh, so I, I was, I knew that he would come and be really prepared for this game. And all in all, I, I was super impressed. I, like you, Mason, I, I even posted it as it happened. I said, this is a spot where K-State should go for it on that uh, fourth and three play. Especially because I thought that they ran the ball and got enough yards because they were trying to set it up to go for it. And especially after that, I think there was like an injury for NC State on that uh, on that same play. 
So I was like, okay, they have time to like think about a fourth down play, and then they ended up they ended up punting, and I was kind of upset. But they and Mason, you already hit on it. And I was literally about to open my statement with like, if you take away like a few plays that, I mean, were either a drop or the ball was a little too like the ball didn't have great placement on it, that or Keegan Johnson slipping on a jet sweep, Casey was really close to really blowing this open on offense and especially in the first half um i believe it was uh avery johnson's first pass was a deep ball to jace Brown. Yeah, that oh. that, like he missed by like half a step and like i i think when everybody kind of gets away further from the game because boy was i in a fight in my mentions trying to talk up connor riley in the offense that the offense wasn't like necessarily the most sexy that it's ever looked yeah, but like, but it got a lot of results. Like, mm -hmm. that, that's a very, very good defense, even without Peyton Wilson. And, and I, I don't know how you guys feel, but I'm gonna take it a step further and say that that offense in the Pop Tarts Bowl was probably better than Colin Klein's debut because of who the opponent was. Yes, I would probably agree with that. Um, because yeah, outside of Peyton Wilson. NC State was, they're not missing many guys that were actual contributors to the team. That was the thing that kind of kept being reiterated throughout the week down there by NC State people was like, well, most of the guys we lost were like practice squad guys, essentially. So, like, in case they it was impressive. Major contributors on offense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, namely, Ben Sennett, who, like, that would have been a massive guy to have for Avery Johnson in his first crew start, and even Phillip Brooks to some extent. Should get some some mention and run Trey there because, too because DJ Giddens yeah. probably doesn't run the ball twenty nine times. Yeah, that's true. Um, so like I, you know, I thought pretty good showing for Connor Riley, and we'll we'll see. Uh, I would imagine that that's probably the first offseason move that we get is that uh, Connor Riley gets named the offensive coordinator. He deserves I, it, and as we know, like nobody should panic too hard about this if it is not working. Chris Kleiman is not afraid to pivot away from guys that he likes and guys that he's buddies with. I mean, he fired Courtney Messingham, who ultimately was not that bad. It just, he he blew it in some major ways, and they just couldn't keep doing that because I think Chris Kleiman knew deep down, like, if we're going to win a Big 12 title and be better than what we have been, we can't afford to have these mistakes, and he made a tough decision. And I think, I would think that he would be willing to make significant changes after next year if things don't go appropriately and he goes i cannot screw up possibly my last year with avery johnson i have to capitalize on this guy so if chris Kleiman does make the hire i don't think anybody should worry about if things don't go well he will pivot if he needs to he has proven that he can do that yeah the other thing that i'll throw out there is that the the game i was calling the pop tarts bowl if you really liked colin klein then you should really like connor riley because they were very similar in how the games were called but yeah. but I, I've kind of came to terms that nobody likes any offensive coordinator. So no. It, and to, yeah, no. I'll just add on to your your point about NC State's defense. They were top 15 each of the last three seasons. So obviously there's a system there that's that's not just Peyton Wilson. That, yeah, uh, I had people trying to tell me that uh the that I pointed out that there was the most rushing yards allowed by NC State all season by far, and people were saying well, you can't be saying that because NC State didn't have guys that played. And I said, yeah, they didn't have Peyton Wilson, but K-State was not was without three guys yes. that were major contributors too. Well, yeah. and like also you talk about the defense. I mean, so Fane and I get to the hotel uh, in Columbia on Friday night and turn on the TV and, you know, it's 11 o'clock or whatever, not much on. ESPNU is showing a replay of the Pop-Tarts Bowl. And one of the first things that like they mention – on the Pop Tarts Bowl broadcast, is that K State had sent members of their staff to Raleigh to learn the defense yeah. that NC State had installed? Like that's how good NC State's defense has been. So yes, like they were missing Peyton Wilson, possibly one of the best defensive players in the country. Well, not he is one of the best defense players in the country, maybe the best. Again, he is really special. Makes a lot of plays for them. He can't make every play for them. And there's a reason why their defense was so good, and it isn't just him. Uh, K State, that was still a good performance. And also, to fans' point, like low possession game. So it's like 
it, it, you don't even get like a full scope of it in, in the grand scheme of things to score, you know, a touchdown on, on four of the 10 possessions and really four of nine because you're not really trying to score on that last one. Uh, even though I know some people that had the over in the game that were, were really <laughs> hoping they would. Uh, that, that it was a fine performance from the K-State offense and Connor Riley. All right. Let's be a little more reflective uh, on 2023. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to give me your favorite game of the season, the most disappointing, and the game that you would want back. So you could you could go back, change the outcome, or have it play out in a different way. Which game are you choosing? I guess in, in terms, the most disappointing could probably be uh, the same as that one, but I think you all might have three separate answers for them. So I'll let Drew start here. Uh, so I'll go favorite as the KU game strictly because it was it's fun to look back and know that K-State's going to win that game now. True. Like at the time, probably I, I wouldn't say that that's my favorite. But right now, like as you think like, huh, KU was winning most of that game and K-State still snuck out of there with a win. So uh, that, that's I that. was I was high on life driving home that <laughs> night. I it was late, but I did not feel tired at all. I was jazzed. So that, that's probably my favorite. Uh, disappointing, I think that we're going to be unanimous here, Iowa State. Uh, that There's no other real words that I really should say, Iowa State. And then a game that I uh, probably want back, uh, Texas. First single from the six-yard line to win the game in overtime, and you don't punch it in. Yeah. I, I think that they can be interchangeable there. Um because I, I would go, I would say that to me, the most disappointing is probably the Texas game, just the way that it played out there and you you had it go through and everything else um, to, to get down there and be in that position and then to have a thing here or there that you could maybe argue you didn't get a call or whatever, like it just didn't work out. That's unfortunate. The game that I, I want back is the Iowa State game, though, because that's really the most unfor. That's the only unforgivable loss uh, of the year, I would say. And looking at how it played out, and also like I will just contend, like that is a game that would have been awesome to win because that's one that ten years from now you're still going on YouTube and watching replays of because of the snow and just everything else in it. Like that's the most unfortunate thing about that. Um, and, and I'm much more about like this isn't college basketball. Uh, you're not getting bonuses for good wins. You know, like you can handle a loss at Oklahoma last year because you beat KU in Manhattan. Uh, in football, it's not really how things work. I hate bad losses in football. I hate losing to teams that you shouldn't lose to. And to lose that game with all the circumstances in Iowa State obviously not being anything special, really, really frustrating. So that is the game I want back for K-State and yeah, I would probably say that the, my favorite game of the year was indeed the KU game. That was enjoyable. And for, you know, everything that Will Howard had to go through this season as well, uh, I'm, I'm glad that he also got that moment in that game to uh, to secure it with the touchdown run. Yeah, I would I would agree most pretty much with Drew. KU, just because that's a nine-win team, um, KU's best team in probably 20 years, second best team, 2008 was better. Um, to beat them, to still have the win against them, even though they won nine and four, uh, and the, the comeback, come back to win the game, just the circumstances of it, even though it wasn't fun in the moment, it's fun looking back on those kind of wins. Um, you'd rather beat them by, I've always said, I'd rather beat them by 35 every time we play. Yes, I don't, agreed. I don't want it to be competitive. I'm not that guy. But uh, looking back, when you do win that close game, it is, it is a little bit satisfying. Um, I would go with the same disappointing as Iowa State just because of the nature of the game. And my want back game would probably be Oklahoma State just because of how bad K-State played in the first half. And even though, you know, this will sound weird because KU went 9-4, and four, Oklahoma State went 10-4, and four, I think KU is probably a better team than Oklahoma State. That, yes. and, even though KU also lost Oklahoma State, but <laughs> Oklahoma State, Overall, was not very good. They got a few things going when they found yeah. out Ollie Gordon could run the ball. But K-State was so bad in the first half of that game that even if they play an average first half, I think they win by 10 points. I think that's I think that's a good answer, too. I mean, you, think about it. 
Oklahoma State probably played their two best games in that two week stretch where they <laughs> played K State and KU. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then they really, I mean, they they beat Oklahoma later in the year, but I still think they probably played their best against K State and KU. Um, yeah, that that's when you want, especially because like at no other point this season did K State ever look that bad. Like there were moments, where, oh, man, this this is frustrating. Never anything as bad as that game uh, and how it went down. So I get that one. I would also say like another one that should probably be considered for game to want back is the Missouri game. You lose on a sixty-plus yard field goal that Dork Wits basically tries to screw up for his team, like. <laughs> maddening and that was just such a crap we talked about how fun the experience walking out of lawrence was that was a crappy drive home from columbia that afternoon after yeah, that watching was a horrible the, the drive home. Formed and just you're watching the train wreck coming for k-state in that game and there were opportunities galore um in all honesty i probably would say that the missouri game is probably the best example uh if you're looking for one game that kind of explains and defines k-state season that the Missouri game is probably pretty similar where there were some really good stretches in that game against Missouri. But at the end of the day, there was just too much that held them back and prevented them from getting over the hump and being special against Missouri. And that's how this season went down. They go nine and four and they end up being just, you know, a team that talent wise and like the numbers probably suggest they, they could have and should have been better. And, there's a reason they were held back, and it's just because I think they lack some, I don't know what it was, motivation, uh, energy, success, like whatever you want to name. They just lacked it in certain moments. And too many times those moments extended for far too many periods of time, and it held them back from what could have been another really awesome season and just made it kind of one of those that I think we'll remember the, the highs of the Avery Johnson stuff this year and a really good finish to the year and a, a good season in general. But – I'm I'm really not sure like how memorable in the grand scheme of things this season will be, especially when it's and it's wild to say that for a nine win team. But I really don't know. It's a pretty nondescript season for K State outside of the KU game and some really painful losses. Yeah, yeah. I mean, l- looking back, I think this season will be most probably remembered for the close losses, beating KU and eating a live mascot. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Those are probably like the the big takeaways because I mean, you th- this is where it's hard to like judge a season because of the unbalanced schedule, but it's like there was no like close win that you're like, oh yeah, I'm really glad that we won that one outside of KU, and then the other really good teams that you've played, you had just excruciating losses. So it's hard to think about it like from that perspective and to like think that like despite all of this, you were going into the final day of the regular season until they made a rule change, like (laughs) thinking that you had a chance to go back to Arlington. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. Yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a good way to uh, put things. And I don't know, tough to to kind of think about Uh Let's, uh, Drew, you mentioned it here. Uh, let me just uh, pull, pull this up for you real quick. Uh, your boy, uh, there he is <laughs> unveiling himself uh, to the crowd. I mean, what a moment that was, electric. Honestly, props to whoever was in the, the Pop-Tart mascot costume because the personality that they gave that mascot perfectly matched and lived up to what they were trying to do with this game. Um I mean, he was a show within himself, so uh, props to everybody's favorite hero, the Strawberry Pop part, uh, who yeah. helped close out a good season for K-State. Yeah, that person was a menace. Like, yeah. the, re-watching that game and just watching the Pop-Tart, like, mannerisms is so funny. And, like, I don't think there was a single negative thing said about anything that, that they did with the marketing of this game. Like the fact that you even had the, the, the ref getting his butt smacked by the mascot and laughing the entire time. Like how, how often could a a mascot do that and get a ref to like give his approval? Very rarely. I think only the strawberry pop tart could achieve that. So uh, props to him and uh, the, the pop tarts bowl in general. 
We're still, uh, uh, we still haven't gotten ratings from everything else. So the Pop Tarts Bowl is still the highest rated bowl of the season. Uh, I it, well, it's been topped now by Ohio State uh, Missouri. So well, that game doesn't count. But of the non New Year Six, it has not been beaten yet. So that game doesn't no. count. The bowl games are broken. Yes, yeah, they are. good point. Uh, all right, uh, let's do a little bit more reflection on 2023. If you had to give one word to describe how the 2023 season went or your feelings for the season, uh, what would that word be? I'll give you guys uh, a moment to to think about it, maybe try and process, see if you want to find uh, a, a elaborate word or something very simple, uh, however you want to kind of – surmise what you felt or saw during this season um i would probably i'm trying to think uh if i'm going to get dinged because it's a a hyphen um and i don't even know if it's the best so maybe i should rethink about what my word's going to be um but i'll give you i'll give you a moment to to think about that and consult your thesaurus or whatever you have by your side right now. I, I just, I thought this would be interesting because like, like we just kind of talked about there, it kind of a weird season. And the fact that not, not really any of the wins were overwhelmingly close or entertaining. And then the losses were just like, so heartbreaking, um, I, which is why I think at the end of the day, like I'll probably just go ahead and, a word that was just flashed on the screen minutes ago. I'm probably just going to say disappointing. Um, look, nine and four should never be a disappointment at K-State. But given the way things played out and how close you were to beating so many really good teams this year, and then you add the cherry on top of disappointment with the loss to Iowa State, um, and you just see how some things and opportunities got squandered, I do think that this was a disappointing season for K-State, and I think it makes it even more disappointing when you consider the fact that I would say that there were some disappointing individual performances and motivation in, in throughout the course of the season. Um, it's just it, it feels like a, lo a lot was left out there for K-State this season, and we certainly know Oklahoma State, was not the caliber of team that really should have been playing for the Big 12 title. There were a handful of other teams that could that would have given a better game, Oklahoma, K-State, KU, you want to name it. And we obviously know that of all those teams, um, K-State and Oklahoma were would have been the best to possibly take them down, especially given the fact that OU did and you know K-State probably should have in Austin. Um, I'm just going to say that this was a disappointing season because K-State was better than 9-4, and four, and I – very rarely do I think you can even say that about K-State, that they were better than 9-4, and four, but it was disappointing. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the word reasonable because I can't – I'm not quite disappointed, although I, I, I think all your logic makes complete sense with what you said there, Mason. Um, but it's not quite good. So reasonable seems like a word that's kind of in the middle. It's It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. Um, it was, you know, the, not any – besides the KU game, we won every other game by, what, 17 points at least. So, yep. uh, which is fun. Like, it's fun to blow out teams you should blow out for the most part. Um, but then the real the real damper on not making it above that was, you know, I guess go back to the Iowa State game. If you win that game, you do go 10-3. and three, Then it can kind of cover a little bit – those disappointing losses. The Iowa State game really is the one that makes it below solid yeah. to me. I honestly, I'll throw this out there. The other word that I had in my mind that I thought about using was nondescript to kind of go along with what you said, fan. Like most of the season was pretty nondescript. It was pretty simple wins uh, that you know took place most of the time, and you know the the, the even most of the close losses. You know, Oklahoma State and Texas, K-State trailed most of those games. Like, the the actual opportunity, it's not like they blew a two-score lead to lose any of these games. They they had to make it close to have that opportunity. So, I nondescript would have been another word that I considered. Uh, I'll, I'll say, I'll use mine as a floor. Failure? That's pretty harsh, Drew. <laughs> mine is a floor. Uh, cause it, it just seems like eight and four. 
in the regular season is Chris Kleiman's floor in a non once in a lifetime pandemic season. And, mm-hmm. and like you'll have the good wins, you could have a frustrating loss or two. And I think that that's just kind of what do you expect now going forward? I mean, there is nothing wrong and it is not accepting mediocrity or failure if you win eight games a year. It is so hard to win in college football consistently, and especially at a school like K State, where if you go eight and four regular season, win your bowl game, and go nine and four, and that's your floor at the moment, you are doing something right. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's roll on here. A couple more things that I want to do here. Uh, this is more so looking ahead to 2024 and everything else. I asked Fan this on our, our ride back. Uh, did anything you saw on the Pop Tarts Bowl win change what your prediction for 2024 would be? So it's way early. And uh, yeah, at some point, like in August, we will give real predictions that count a little bit more. But as of right now, what's your opinion of K State? Did the expectation change after the Pop Tarts Bowl and what you saw? And what is the prediction for K State's 2024? I mean, nothing for me really changed. Like, I I think that we all kind of had expectations of where Avery Johnson was going to be at the Pop-Tarts Bowl, but kind of thought that the expectation is that he's going to just keep getting better. So, I mean, I, I think that nothing has really changed because I, I think that this could be another potential 9-3 and three regular season if I'm just going to throw out a record right now in 2024 because this staff is full of winners and all they really seem to know how to do is win. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say nothing has really changed for me. You still probably need a few more skill guys on offense. You need to patch a little bit of holes on defense before I feel like really comfortable saying all of these things. But I, I think that, it's not out of the question that K State could make it to Arlington next year. I mean, somebody literally, this is the, like my reasoning, and it's such bad reasoning, just saying it out loud, but somebody has to. I mean, the the, the top half of the league is so even mm-hmm. just from the outskirts right now of where we are without rosters being set. Like, there's no reason that you can say, like, this team is for sure making it, and this team is for sure not making it outside of like probably Cincinnati is the one where you're like, yeah, they're probably not, but everybody else you're like, you, you have a shot. I, I think the biggest question going into next year is going to be uh, the, the changes to the offensive line, because look, I did not think as highly of the offensive line as some people did. Obviously you had one amazing player in Cooper BB and a ton of experienced guys and experience is important. Um, but I felt like that they underwhelmed at times and like they're, I don't think that the offensive line as a whole, all five guys are totally irreplaceable. Like I think you can make up for it. It's just going to be a matter of how the guys that are tasked with that do it. But like, I look at it right now in K state's conference games next year, there's no reason to think that they aren't the better team than every team they play. Uh, even as it stands right now, based on what, you know, that they are losing and what we saw playing the pop tarts bowl. Like, I would take K-State's Pop-Tarts Bowl roster in a game against BYU, in a game against Colorado, in a game against Houston, Iowa State, Arizona State, Oklahoma State, KU, Cincinnati, West Virginia. Like, KU's the best team K-State's going to play in conference play next year. There's no doubt about that. Um, outside of that, then it's like, I mean, do you, you think Deion Sanders actually knows what he's doing as a head coach? I, I don't, so whatever. Uh, you know, Iowa State – what is that going to be next year? Oklahoma State, can they kind of repeat, but they're going to be looking for a, a quarterback again. So I, I I think this is a K-State team that my prediction or my optimism for next year went up more. I, I do think based on what I saw with how good Avery Johnson was and the excitement that some of the other guys that will return gave me, my optimism goes up. I mean, I, I think right now, Nine and three is probably a good regular season prediction. And you would hope that that's good enough to get K-State to Arlington. And given 
the round robin nature and you know kind of the the up and down of the league maybe it's going to be good enough maybe it won't be um and i say nine and three because that's a tough non-con for k-state look Tulane's not going to be as good but you have to go on the road next year to new orleans and then you come back home and you have to face a really good arizona team who might be one of the favorites to win the big 12 next season given what they're bringing back and how well they played this year it but, would be, it'd be hilarious if K-State in Arizona played in the non-conference and then in the Big 12 championship game next year. <laughs> would be very funny. That so uh, I'm going to say 9-3 and three is the expectation next season for K-State at this moment for me. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think 9-3 and three is what came to mind for me initially. Um, I'm encouraged by the skill positions on offense. Uh, we talked about that already, I think. We've got a solid core there. I think there's a solid core on defense. Uh, Mason, I think your questions about the offensive line are very good. Um, I think that is the part that will have to come together. But I do think, um, as you said it well, I think K-State had a star in Cooper Beebe, some other solid players. And you could start over with a new group. Some of these guys have got some playing times uh, over the last couple of years, and they've got some reps. So you could still end up with a unit that the sum is as good as – the sum is greater than its parts kind of thing based compared to this year with, with the experience case they had and uh, obvious uh, all American Cooper BB. So um, I think that that's well said uh, defensively, you know, I, I like a lot of the pieces we have back, Let's get some linebackers back that were injured at the end of the year could help um, defensive linemen that were injured at the end of the year that could help. You can add, add some pieces in the portal, you know, um, definitely. I think, this team could use a guy that can be one of the top three receivers based on the guys we have coming back. I'd like to see a guy added there. Um, and then defensively, you're probably looking for some parts, another secondary guy, maybe another defensive lineman to, to add in, to add some depth. Uh, but this is a wide open Big 12 in the new era um, without Oklahoma and Texas in the league. I think Utah, Arizona coming in will be challenges. KU is going to be pretty good. Oklahoma State probably be pretty good. Uh, you would think TCU might be better than what they were. Um, bottom of the barrel teams, I think Cincinnati's down there. I don't see Baylor reloading. That was a bad team. I, I, BYU should get better, but I, I think they're, they've got a ways to go. Arizona State's pretty bad. And then Colorado, I, I agree with your assessment that I don't know that rebuilding your offensive line through the portal is the best idea. Coach Sanders, that maybe you want to develop some of those guys and not run everybody off, but we'll see what happens with that team. We do have to go there as well. So, yeah, it'll be fun to see what happens. Um, but I, I do think nine and three is a pretty good target for this team next year. Yeah, we'll see how it uh, ends up going from there. All right, last thing that we will do here, uh, for this show and kind of recapping last year, looking ahead to next year. Uh, I'm going to task you guys, you say you are. Uh, I don't know, one of the thousands of law firms that are making cheesy, stupid commercials in Wichita and just flooding the TV screens or you now own a car dealership or, you know, whatever, whatever local business you have. You want to sign a, a couple of cats, say you want to sign two guys to your NIL roster for the, the upcoming year. But obviously you're, you're starting out. You are not. Uh, you know, one of the big dogs. So you cannot go out and get Avery Johnson for next year. Um, you might be trending towards the direction of you can't get DJ Giddens even. So we're going to play a little 2024 NIL stock market here. <laughs> Who are you buying low on right now as, you know, somebody that could pay off long-term in your NIL space for a low price right now? Uh, give me two guys going into next year that you would take for K-State NIL-wise. I'll, I'll go with Drew first because – uh, he's probably got the best knowledge of the roster, considering the fact that he has to have the best knowledge of the roster for him. So uh, give me your NIL stock market picks for next year for K-State and maybe help out a, a small business owner listening right now. All right. So how small of a business are we? Like, uh, Let's see. Um, I'm. Let me try and think of. Uh, like can we afford a starter? Yeah, you can afford a, a starter, but like. They they should probably be guys that like, yeah, they're a starter, but like they're limited in their touches and and snaps or something like, uh, you name it, and I'll 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 give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. 
All right, so to start, we'll we'll uh start we'll buy low on Chidi Obi Azor, the defensive end from Minnesota. Okay. I think that he's probably going to be somebody that will get some playing time next year on our little stock market. And then let's see, where, where do I want to go next? That this caught me so off guard when I saw this <laughs> pop up on the screen. Uh, we'll go. Hmm. And then we'll go. We'll buy. Uh, we'll buy Asa Newsom coming off of an in, in, coming off of an injury. Okay, defensive guy right here. Uh, drew all over the defense and uh, what they can go ahead and do. So yeah, I, I think those are probably two really good picks. Uh, especially you know we got to see Cheedy in the game uh, down in Orlando and see how things went there. So uh, I, I think half a sack in the Pop Tarts Bowl. Yeah, have a sack in the, in the Pop-Tarts Bowl. The only uh, really stat that the defensive ends registered in the Pop-Tarts Bowl. So uh, props to, to them there and how that ended up going down. All right. Uh, I, I, think those are, I think those are great picks, and I'll be interested to see uh, if, if that pays dividends. So to anybody listening that they want maybe a, a lesser NIL deal to, to <laughs> sign, those are your, your picks right now, and you're banking on them making it big for uh next season uh i am going to i'm trying to think of who i want to make my official picks be uh and and where i i kind of want to go with this for for k-state because i i like what you did with the defense and so i don't want to like overwhelm and just keep loading up on defensive guys um i this is one you could also debate maybe he's getting too pricey now but I've always been a fan of his. Uh, fan probably was not a fan of his for at least a couple of years. Uh, I'm going to go with Damian Eli Leo uh, because, look, like I, we, we saw him get more time to play this year. He did some good things. He's a local Manhattan guy, and I just, I, I like, I think the ascension for him will continue. And he has just always impressed me when he was at Manhattan High, and he, he's not ever going to have a you know, lack of energy be a problem. I think that would be uh, a good guy to get roped into it. Plus, I think that there's probably some good personality there to him. Then, you know, who do I want to pair? I just said I don't really want to go all defense on this. I feel I feel like we're going to, you know, offensive guys would be a little bit disappointed. Um, I mean, but I don't know. Like, the defense might have the guys with the best upside right now. Moving forward, if you're that we can that we can afford in this scenario, I, I would I would tend to agree. Yeah, because like the offense, the the guys that are around, you know them and everything else. Um, man, I I don't know. This is tough. I I'll, I'll try and find an offensive guy uh, to to throw out there. I mean, may, maybe because of the role and everything else that you would say, like Garrett Oakley, like buy in on Garrett Oakley now. And the fact that if he can kind of turn into the Ben Senate role and by all accounts, like the, t the talent will be there. And like, I'm not saying that he's going to be just as good as Ben Senate, but he can, he can fill that role nicely. Like you can get yourself a guy that is going to catch touchdowns that is probably at an affordable price right now. So I would say get in on the Garrett Oakley hype machine and uh, hope that it pays off for you. So those would be my two picks right now, just to make it, you know, whatever. So, uh, fan, you can go now. And if you if you have to repeat picks, that's totally fine because we put you in a tough spot going last. Well, I like Oakley, but I'll pick a different one. He he would have been the one I would have picked. But I'll and pick maybe one. maybe we can give you you DJ Gins because he might give you like a hometown <laughs> discount. Or a hometown oh, discount. DJ's my guy, but I think he's too high profile for my company because he's a <laughs> stud. And we're not, and my company doesn't know what it means to be turned yet. So yeah, we got. <laughs> We got to figure that one out, just like Coach Kleiman said the other day. Um, defensively, though, I would go Toby O. I think Osinsami yes. is going to be a dynamic playmaker on this defense. I think they've got a good offseason to kind of figure out what his role is going to be. And, you know, they've had the, this year to work him in a little bit, but I think next year he'll have a more set role and he'll have a spot where he can play. And I think he's a dynamic playmaker. I mean, I, I coached against him when he was at Wichita East, and he was a stud then. Thought he was – a guy K-State should go after. I was, I was happy when they did. Um, so I think he's going to be a stud. And I'm going to go – I'm going to go Trace Bivey as my offensive guy. Like, 
you know, young guy. I was his name for a while. Got a, got a few reps this year, got a catch, uh, but he's a guy that is is on the verge, I think, of explosiveness. We've had those guys for a while, though. You know, I mean, honestly, R.J. Garcia was supposed to be that guy coming into this year. Carlos Strickland. <laughs> yeah, we've had those guys. Rash and Taylor. But, hey, think, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> hey, hey. He, he lived up. You know, he was he made some plays in there. Megatron was he was good. Don't Megatron. don't throw him in the same vein as some of these other guys. But but I do think if if Casey is not able to land that third uh, third wide receiver from the portal, I think Trace Spivey has the ability to be that guy. So those are my picks. I I can I definitely considered Trace Spivey, uh, and I I love Toby Austin saw me. Maybe hey maybe it's because I want the hometown discount. You know which guy <laughs> you can get it too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so no, that's, those are, those are good picks there and everything else. All right. Well, we've been around for uh, a while here now. Uh, real quick, you guys can get your thoughts on the college football playoff tomorrow. Some people watching or listening to this, they'll probably, the games will probably already be going or have been completed. Uh, but just real quick, throw out your picks for both games tomorrow and who you think we see in the national championship this year, because I think we get an Alabama, Texas rematch. I agree. Bama, Texas. And we listen to plenty of, podcast on the way home breaking those down yesterday joe clatt everybody yeah. cover three good stuff yeah I, I i agree heart heart wants michigan washington but i think we're gonna get alabama texas and uh, you know i unfortunately think that alabama wins the second meeting i think i think alabama wins the national championship this year i hope yeah. i'm wrong um I, like i i'd be totally fine with washington doing it and look in in a weird way like I used to be really cool with Jim Harbaugh in Michigan because, like, I felt like he got unfairly criticized and kind of, like, poo-pooed away. It's like, I don't know, the guy came to Michigan, revived him. They were not doing anything. Like, quit dumping on him because he goes 10-2 and two or whatever, 11-1. and one. Now he's actually winning, but he's kind of cheating left and right uh, in, like, just blatantly obvious ways. And, like, if you're going to cheat, at least – you know, at least be Bill Self about it. Like, yeah. you can be brash after it comes out a little bit, but, like, still play the game. Don't just be like, mm, screw you, rules are kind of stupid here. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep breaking them, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and create new ways to break them that nobody else even thinks about breaking them. At least, you know, at least Bill Self's a follower. He just says, you guys are cheating like this. I'll do it, too. I'm going to do it better than you, though. Uh, I, I'm, out on, I'm out on Michigan, so, like, if they have to win it, I don't know, that's fine. And I'll I'll zag here. I would actually be okay with Texas winning the national championship this year. Number one, I do think that they are one of the four best teams in the country. I think they can beat anybody on any given day. And I also think it would be really, really funny if they win their last national championship as a Big 12 member and they join the long list of schools that will never be able to live up to what they did in the Big 12. Uh, and you know, for for one last time, they will go out there and give the Big Twelve something. And if they go out and win it as a Big Twelve school, that's a that's a title for the Big Twelve. Uh, as dirty as it feels, I would take it. So um, I am okay with Texas winning it. And certainly, if they beat Washington, that's who I would be pulling for uh, in the national championship game. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Plus, plus down. Texas gets to go to an SEC where you don't get to be part of a crappy division. You're going to yeah. have to. Everybody gets the shot. The top two teams are going. Same with Washington going to the Big Ten as well. So that'll yeah, be interesting yeah. to watch. Yeah, Texas and Washington. I mean, might not. They may never get back. Uh, it's, <laughs> they're going to be getting taken out of the ball game here. Uh, and Washington. It's wild the fact that they've made two playoffs uh, yeah. in the, yeah. the you know ten year history that it's been around now. Kind of surprising and done it with different coaches and like totally different kind of eras of it and everything so all right well that will uh go ahead and do it for this edition of the kso show thanks to drew galloway case you underscore fan i'm mason both and i'm gonna get out of here before i try coughing with covid <laughs> and the sinusitis that led to getting a uh, shot in my backside yesterday uh, for the first time <laughs> in my life that was quite the experience so thanks for watching and listening to the kso show with a side of tmi